All right, so I'm gonna welcome our presenters. Um, I'll just do it very, you know, briefly. Uh, we're really happy to have from the New York Botanical Gardens, Lester T. Burks Library, uh, Rashad Bell, and from the William and Linda Steer Herbarium, uh, Regina Vitello, who are gonna talk about their project on decolonizing botanical catalogs. So take it away. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this goes well. All right, do you see what I see? Yep. Excellent. Let that load. Okay, so um, currently the Lewester T. Mertz Library and the Steer Herbarium at NYBG are working on decolonizing our catalogs. Botanical resources in particular have a colonial past and our catalogs have some biased subject headings, authority names, and localities built into them. Um, on our web platforms especially, this language requires an explanation. The herbarium aspires to digitize roughly 8 million specimens and make them available on the web. Because we eventually transcribe and georeference all the written localities on specimen labels, we often end up highlighting obscure and comical names of places. So um, you can see here is an example of a label that shows a location called Useless Bay, which I think is quite funny for a name, but it can also highlight um, places that have a clear history of European exploration. For example, this is Robinson Crusoe Island, or in this particular example, we have Pirate's Cove. Um, and here we have places named Indian Village, which is not a proper noun. Um, that's just a description a collector wrote. Um, less frequently, but equally noticeably, we have labels with offensive language in the locality itself. The official place names of these locations can contain words that belittle groups of people and even racial slurs. Um, and you can see some of these have much more upsetting locality names. Um, transcribing and georeferencing and posting these place names is a process that can stress our staff and create a false impression of institutional values. Staff working on digitization projects, volunteers and interns are often the first line of discovery for this text. Localities often need to be transcribed many times. So in this particular example, you can see how a collector might visit a location frequently or multiple collectors could visit a location and you can have to transcribe a place a lot. <laughs> um, we have created a workflow to mark and separate these types of records for high uh, senior level staff to review. We're working with multiple herbaria and local peoples to make a disclaimer for this type of data for our virtual herbarium site. Um, yet, you know, we don't want to censor information related to our collections. It's important that we do capture all of this information. Um, so then there's a, um, another aspect to our decolonization process. When presenting label information to the public, we face another challenge. The hidden figures listed as secondary collectors. Um, like the authority records in libraries, our collection records generally only attach a party record for the first collector named on a specimen. This is a practical measure meant to save time entering data. Much digitization work in herbaria is grant-based, so it's critical to not over-detail records. Um, however, lots of information on women and indigenous collectors can be made obscure by not attaching a full record of their person. Um, it is not uncommon for the wife uh, who shared collecting responsibilities. So in this particular example, you can see um, J.G. Lemon and his wife. And in the lower image on the screen, that's actually Herbert Smith's wife's handwriting, and there's a lot of documentation and field notes that she actually mounted and collected almost all of his specimens. Um, yeah, so they share equal responsibility collecting a specimen to be, they might not be listed on the label or listed second on a label. Often scientists visiting a region will enlist the help from locals. Historically, botany rarely acknowledged these people's role in collection or it, it was not the prominent number listed. 
when their work was recorded, there was almost never a name of the inv individual who did the collecting. Um, one of the ways we're placing more emphasis on capturing this information by attaching party records for these types of individuals, creating a record for what we know about some of the specimens, unnamed primary collectors. So if a local person collected the specimen and we don't have a name for them, we can make a party record for that person. Um, and even if we don't have details, we can at least give them credit for their work. This should also improve the discoverability for these types of stories. Um, we are placing more emphasis on capturing this information. I, I think people sometimes believe that scientific records are free from social biases and historically problematic thinking. However, with the digital visibility of this information, I think Herbaria now can collaborate with local communities and even official place naming channels. So um, something interesting we came across while doing research on our more hard to transcribe labels is that the names of these official places don't necessarily have to stay the names of those places. In fact, where collectors collect can sometimes be small and obscure natural areas that don't even have a, a large population, which might be why they still have old fashioned names. So there's, there's avenues for updating how these places are referred to. While the scope of this work is large, it goes a long way towards changing the relationship scientific data has, data collection has with the communities from which it's harvested. All right, and then I think Rashad can present on the library end of our work. Thanks, Regina. Um, yeah, do you mind uh, clicking through for me since you got control of I the got you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, in the library, our challenges are similar, but a little different and mostly come from dealing with antiquated language that, you know, is coupled with useful information. And it's easy to see that kind of stuff in a book title. Um, Regina, if you don't mind clicking through. Yeah, so you see that it's like George Washington Carver, God's Ebony Scientist, like that wouldn't really fly today. Um, and historically, what the library has done with this kind of stuff is put a, an excerpt from a book review to kind of validate the information or, you know, and the authority of the text. If you don't mind, give me another click through. So you can see here, we have the, uh, the title page and then this book review from, uh, from 1944 when the book was released. Even in the first sentence, you can see it says Basil Miller's book on Dr. Carver is pedestrian, but contains fresh material that is interesting. So even though, you know, this book might, you know, initially seem a bit offensive, you try to say, hey, you know, this has something worthwhile in it, and we're not just holding on to it for antiquity, you know. Um, so we deal with this kind of stuff, and it's one of those things you can't really always initially you know, uh, handle because you're not sure what's in every book. Every book isn't going to tell you from its title that it has questionable content or something that might bother someone. So there is a plan to write a disclaimer after a couple of conversations. You know, it's like, well, you can talk to the catalogers and have them put something in the record. But it's like, you know, we have so many items in the collection. It's not as easy as like with the herbaria content where, you know, <laughs> All right, and that's not to say it's easy, but it's not as obvious, I guess I should say. Right. So, you know, you're never going to know. And it's like, all right, I'm going to add this much work to our already swamp catalogers. And like, and we don't have interns or things like that. So it's usually just me in the stacks. And, you know, I might discover something when I'm pulling it for someone else's research, you know, or my own. But um, so there's the committee, but the issue is the awareness. Like, how do we you know, get the rest of the staff to be aware when they encounter this stuff to, and what do they do? You know, we've had uh, situations where people, you know, will just not say anything, or we've had situations where it's like people have been hesitant to add things to the collection. And, you know, the goal is to not censor anything. So you want to make people comfortable with that. So there has to be a conversation on that level as well. And so, like, like I said, I've brought it up before and it's just a, a process, you know, of progress, if you will, 
to uh, of what to do and uh you know now we have a committee formed to write a disclaimer but and then the question becomes like is there a rule by committee and then how many places around do you put the disclaimer to make sure that that's seen and then that can you know uh, potentially set you up for scrutiny because then you know we live in a world of access you know that's kind of the goal for what we do but there's always trolls and people that are going to go looking for trouble but um uh regina if you don't mind giving me another click through real quick i put another yeah. same example of questionable content here so this is like from a, a survival guide for military and uh, you see we have caricatures of uh, natives and little uh questionable ways and how to interact with them that is can uh can be considered demeaning and could be insulting for some even though you know this is of a certain time you know you know how people love to use content to various means these days so you have to be careful with that but um figured maybe if you guys were curious i would read uh what was tentatively written uh by someone in the committee as our disclaimer and then it goes, uh, the New York Botanical Gardens collection databases offer public access to a wide range of information, including historical materials that may contain offensive and unacceptable language. NYBG is committed to preserving collections data in their original forms for historical accuracy and to facilitate research. The information associated with the collection data does not reflect the views of or values of NYBG. We welcome feedback and questions about language found in our databases. Please contact collections at nybg.org. So that was written, and that was written by someone in the uh, in the committee, one of the Arab area staff. Um, but like I said, the question becomes, where do you put this? And also, we you know we work, we manage these collections, but we work for an institution. And so then a committee is formed. The institution has to have to say they not may you know may not be as familiar with the collections as we are, and you get stuck in these weird rule by committee issues and so that becomes the biggest issue and like i said you kind of just want to build awareness amongst your staff to be able to handle this stuff in addition to having you know the the disclaimers and everything and that's kind of how i see the the work of decolonizing your collection i agree yeah that's that's what we've been working on as well Particularly, um, just to piggyback on that, mentioning feedback, I feel like that's a huge aspect of this. We have feedback buttons on our website as well that allow us to locate things and make sure that they have the right kind of context. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. So, uh, Let me hit. Exit. Uh, do I? Yeah. Mm, you are sharing. Sorry, let me. How do? Can you exit the screen share or? Yeah, I can't exit my screen share. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. And pause. I, is it pause share? I think so. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I, should, I should know Zoom better than I do by now, but. Oh, I, okay. you know, it feels intuitive usually. And <laughs> okay, good. Are we back? Excellent. So, yeah, that was. Um, I really was hoping to start a conversation about this as well because I know everyone here works with museum collections and um, the context around them. And this is something that I'm sure people have similar experience with in terms of how do you present things digitally um, and not give a false impression and also represent the um, creators that went into this work. I 
I have a comment for Rashad. Um, I'm glad you talked about the placement of the disclaimer because that's a conversation that we've had twice now in two years <laughs> about how to notify people that there's stuff in the repository that might surprise them a little bit. And we decided about a year and a half ago to just put it in an item record, so not say at the very top of the collection, you're gonna find some stuff in here that might bother you, but to sort of hide it in metadata um, and in our repository, which is DSpace, you have a collection and then an item landing page, and then you get down to item metadata. So it's pretty far down right now. Um, we talked about this again very recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago. We decided that we we're still happy with that decision, but I'm wondering what other people have um, discussed, if they've discussed the same thing. Um, maybe I can jump in. At the um, Herbaria, we have, um, put a disclaimer on our website at the moment under digital collections. Mm -hmm. We are intending to put it actually um, prominently on the site where we do the database search. Um, and uh, I know the, uh, the Peabody um, here at Harvard, the museum has um, a, disc a similar disclaimer, similar to what Rashad had read um, and they have it at the front of their um, database search as well. So it's not on item level. Um, it is really right there when um, you access, yeah, when you access our, our digital data, um, we want to, uh, the people see um, that first because when you search our database, the um, individual results that you may get um, you may see some in the summary already. So I, we, um, I feel like it's um, for in our, in our situation, how our database is structured and how our, our web present is structured, that's a better place. Yeah, I think um, we've been discussing that as well at the right up front and center where, you know, maybe it's also because we now have the time to really do the work on this and make sure our disclaimer is, you know, worded exactly how we want it to be that we're thinking about putting it much more prominently than on item levels that we've had in the past. I just wanted to um, read some comments and questions from the chat, but um, uh, Diane, did you want to read your comment or is it okay if I do? I'm, I'm happy to, to go ahead and read it. That, okay. um, the Smithsonian libraries and archives are grappling with the same issue and maybe Polly is going to want to chime in also. Um, but particularly with respect to digitized open access items, like we have a lot of sheet music and some of it is, you know, has racist depictions, things like that. So do we put a disclaimer? It, does it go with the image or do we decide not to make them open access, publicly viewable online. And currently we do have an open access committee that is, I, I think what we're doing is holding those back until we've come to some sort of consensus on what kind of disclaimer or do we just not make those publicly viewable even though they're, they should be CC0 um, online. Um, maybe I can jump in again. We had um, I, um, conversations with our disability office here at Harvard and the DIB office. And um, I also talked to the um, uh, American Museum of, um, oh my gosh, I'm always blanking on the, the full name of the, uh, of the museum. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in, at the Smithsonian, the um, African American Museum of History and Culture, I think that's it. Um, and uh, the consent kind of like was um, to not hide um, data um, because it's part of the history and um, rather to, to involve or start, make it a conversation. Uh, and in education, I use it as an educational tour, tool. And um, part of the, the reason to not hide um, the data is because it is history. You don't necessarily, you don't want to hide history. 
And you also don't want to reduct information because that makes it impossible for some um, folks of the, of the uh, population to actually use and, and find the data. So it is a rather complex issue and I think it really needs a lot of discussion. Um, yeah, but that was like the, the short summary of, of the conversations that I had and other folks had also. At CSU, <clears throat> excuse me, my boss is a public historian, and so he feels very strongly that content should be made available with the proper context. And it's so nice to have someone like him in the room to express that really eloquently. It, it just cuts through all kinds of conversations where people are really hesitant and they don't want to offer up the material and they're really frightened about the response from the public. Um, so I'm very lucky in my context to have him there. Mm -hmm. Maybe one thing that I should add was that um, there seemed to be the um, consent that if there is like a historical name um, and it has been replaced with a more modern name, um, it is absolutely fine to do the replacement um, because that's different from reduction. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if you decide to, um, to keep the, um, the historical name to really make sure um, to denote that that is like the original language and then kind of like mark of what the um, mark the, the uh, currently used name and that for the herbarium specimens it is mainly place names on labels um, or maybe cultivar um, or taxon names. And so we had some a few questions coming in the chat. I just want to make sure we don't um, miss any of them. It looks like so, it looks like you answered this one in the chat, but um, so, uh, we had one question. Using book reviews in that way is really interesting and useful method for indicating the library's intended value of questionable texts, but you're right, a lot of work to find and add. Um, and Rashad responded, it's very hard to maintain, especially for older titles. Um, and then let's see, we have another question here. Can we hear more about the process of surfacing quote unquote hidden figures, especially women who might be identified in records using their husband's name? Any advice on the research process to identify these names? Yeah, um, so there's kind of two types of hidden figures we have in these secondary um, collector fields where you have um, someone who is named, but is almost always um, a secondary collector. So they might not have a full parties record. Um, and that, because we have a name, we can easily put in the effort to make them a record and do the type of research to, you know, get their, um, the dates and the story behind their work put onto our database so that that's accessible. But then you also have um, folks who are not named. So like in the case of native collector or local guide, um, much harder to do research for. In that case, we might refer to field notes and sometimes you get more context of like at least where this person is from and um, how the collector whose name is on the sheet encountered them and the nature of the work that they did together. Um, and then in the case of, I feel like with the handwriting, it tends to be the wives or the, the secretaries of collectors, unfortunately. Um, that, that I also use field notes a lot for. There's a lot of bi biographical information on certain collectors as well. Yes, that is an excellent um, link that someone just posted. Oh, yeah. Um, Harvard has a lot of um, collector information, but I will literally dig into their um, field notes frequently and they will talk about their travels with their wife and you can gain an insight into the nature of their collecting and how the responsibility was shared between the two. And I guess in terms of recognizing handwriting, that's just something where when you've worked with a particular section of the herb herbarium and you've worked with you know um, collections by that person, frequently, you do start to recognize them. Obviously, it's not officially signed by that person, but it's something we like to put in notes so that it's searchable. Um, and yeah, in the case of Herbert Smith, where that was 
clearly recognizably his um, wife's handwriting. And there's a lot of documentation around how his wife prepared almost all of his specimens. Um, there might be a project there where we can get her a different type of credit on that individual record. But um, currently, we um, can just give context to the Smith collections as a whole so that someone would know his wife was involved in that work. I added that um, link to Harvard's herbaria disclaimer, and it looks like, uh, is that you, Helen, adding CSUs? Oh, good. Yes. I mean, if anyone has any other additional links to language they want to drop in the shared notes, I know those things are always, I know when I was, you know, practicing, <laughs> practicing in a library, <laughs> other people's language is always very useful to uh, refer to. <laughs> Any um, any additional questions or points of discussion? Oh, great! Thanks for adding another disclaimer. I'll add that to the shared notes. Um, so I guess. Um, uh, we can certainly always continue the conversation on the museum's cohort listserv, um, which there is a link to join that uh, at the bottom of the agenda uh, there. So definitely, uh, my video again. definitely feel free to uh, join up and uh, stay stay uh, current with what the museum's cohort is working on as well as uh, keep updated on our upcoming meetings. Uh, before I move on to the uh, DLF, oh, I, sorry, I just missed someone's uh, uh, question in the chat. Uh, are plans moving forward with this work? Um, yeah, so uh, definitely, like we were saying, we want to get more on the website. I feel like um, Rashad covered a lot how it can be a struggle institutionally what we are allowed to publish and we have to get approval every step of the way. So um, it, it's helpful also to show what other institutions are doing. I feel like sometimes in the museum community, we like the reassurance of seeing um, the work of others and knowing that we're on the right track. Um, and yeah, I think on the database end of things that you know informs our digital presence, we're trying to create um, more accurate authority files and more accurate um, ways of searching for these locations. And I guess um, another thing that we're considering is the, the type of stress this work has on workers who frequently have to go through these types of locations. So it's the idea of making the workplace a little bit friendlier for people who work with this information on a regular basis. Yeah, and uh, just to, well, first to answer the second part of the question about, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with administrators is really um, getting, just showing them the value of it. And I think a lot is like putting Unfortunately, you have to put this kind of stuff on display and kind of get it out there in front of people so that they understand that, oh, this is something we need to take care of. Uh, like a good example is uh, for, we did a Black History Month exhibit here in the library uh, about Black botany, and that kind of got some attention. And then, you know, we were able to have those conversations and um, the Hanlon's website with the herbarium is the same exa uh, similar example is like you kind of have to do stuff first yeah. and then like, you just have to show them. So to, to answer the first question, like one of my plans to move forward is I really, really want to do an exhibit that just puts this stuff on display. That just like mm. we have this stuff in our collections and we're aware of it. We're not trying to hide it, you know. So here it is. Like look at it, take it in and then we can talk about the context. 
Agreed. Yeah. Just to piggyback on um, the hand lens website is kind of our interactive blog we have with the herbarium and it lets us attach stories to different specimens. So um, yeah, we will frequently do a deep dive on maybe a hidden botanist who was the wife of someone or who, who accompanied a more famous botanist and how their story might get lost if you're just looking at the data. But when you give it context, it's unique and interesting. That's great. Uh, could you make sure to drop a link to that? In I the can drop right? a link to that. Yeah, right now. Great. Um, any, any, any uh, additional follow-up questions before we wind down? I'll wait a little bit longer in case anyone's using the chat this time. Great, thanks for that link. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I think we're, I think, I think that's about it. But um, thank you so much, Regina and Rashad. This was a really great discussion and a very cool project. So I'm so glad that you came to share this with us today.